Okay, so for your um, research project for this semester, we are going to be looking at medicinal natural products or supplements. And we're going to be focusing on um, whatever disease you want of your choice. You can pick a supplement of your choice or a natural product of your choice, and you can look at its effect on uh, any disease or disorder that you choose. Um, and what you will be looking at is essentially uh, scientific proof that that supplement actually works or doesn't work. Cool? So, I want to move this layer thing somewhere. Maybe I'll move it. So the goals of our project, the reason we are doing this is that as part of the biology curriculum, our, um, some of our objectives for our bio majors is to learn how to use the scientific method appropriately, how to design experiments to, research, uh, to do research in a research setting. Uh, we also want our students to know how to search and read and understand primary and secondary literature pertaining to their questions, um, how to interpret the published data, um, and how to resynthesize that data uh, and to make their own conclusions or their own decisions. Um, and then obviously in, throughout the process, we will be learning the necessary computer skills you need uh, to combine biological data, um, to manage it in Excel sheets and figures and graphs. Um, and to show them, obviously, in uh, order to present their findings. So for this particular project, you will be presenting a poster presentation as with your partner as a group. So what exactly are medicinal natural products and supplements? Um, they are referred to in many different ways. They can be uh, called just supplements or natu natural uh, products but they are many times referred to as herbal medicine or Ayurvedic medicine when it's related to South, uh, South Asia, um, botanical medicine or phytotherapy. So it's basically using plants to uh, better your health. Um, it is used in some form or another by over 80% of the world's population. Some people may only be taking a vitamin supplement or a single supplement. Some take a lot of them. My mother-in-law loves taking these, so we have a lot in our house some days. Um, and then, you know, if you look at the market nowadays, there are over 750 herbs and supplements that can be used, that can be found as natural supplements that people can use. And it is a $5 billion um, industry just in US alone every year. And that's just one country. In Europe, actually, it's even more prevalent. So how do they exactly work? There are three components of how natural supplements work. Um, the first one is synergism. The second one is phytonutrients, and that's a typo. And the third one is antioxidants. So we'll go through each one of those and talk about how it is that uh, that particular side works. So the first one, which is synergism, Synergism basically means working together, right, at the end of the day. Um, and the main idea here is that the therapeutic effect that that particular supplement or herb or uh, natural product provides is a combined result of multiple compounds and multiple ingredients working together. It's not just acetaminophen that is giving you the pain relief. It is a bunch of different you know, uh, molecules combined together that are giving you the final result. So an example of this would be tea tree oil, uh, which a lot of people use for an uh, antimicrobial effect. They also use it for uh, keeping bugs away, right? It's a great insect, natural insect repellent. Um, people can use it for allergies. Um, so there are multiple reasons people can use tea tree oil. It has eight bioactive ingredients that have just antimicrobial properties. If we were to test every single one of them separately in the lab setting, they will have very little effect. Like, you know, I compare it to some type of a positive control, some kind of an antibiotic with a really strong effect. It's all going to look like it only works like 10% or 30% uh, activity compared to that full antibiotic. 
However, when you combine them together, it has super strong activity and it even sometimes works better than the traditional medicine. And that complexity, you know, those multiple compounds working together is what makes it difficult for microbes to develop resistance to that compounds because it's not a single compound they're fighting against, right? These compounds are all interacting with each other somehow to give that combined effect. So it's not one plus one equals two, it's one plus one equals four, a lot higher activity together. Um, that's in comparison to our single compounds in conventional medicine, which sometimes you find super good compounds that work really well, but because this is a single compound, it's gonna be a lot easier for the microbe to develop resistance against that one single compound. The second part of uh, using natural uh, products is phytonutrients, the presence of phytonutrients in them. Phytonutrients are chemicals or compounds found in the plant that make them biologically active. These are not actual nutrients. They are not providing nutritional value, but they are providing they are the bioactive compounds. They're providing other um, effects. They can serve as defense mechanism against insects in the normal setting. So the plant uses them to protect them against insects, for example. Um, they can also uh, work together in groups to enhance healing effect of each other, which is what we just talked about, the synergism property. Um, and they act as a source for color for the plant, the flavor of the plant, and obviously natural disease resistance. When you look at their function in humans or you know, when we ingest them as a, a supplement, um, they have been known to detoxify body, some of them, right? Each, not all of them will do all these things, but they can have one of these properties or multiple properties within that uh, chart. They can detoxify our body and strengthen the liver, which also obviously works to detoxify our body. So they can be a helper. They can work synergistically with the liver to detoxify. They can have anti-cancer activity. There are lots of compounds that have anti-cancer activity. And many of the traditional chemotherapy drugs have also been derived from these natural products that were originally found to have anti-cancer activity. Taxol is one of them, something that we've talked about previously and we will talk about again in the next several weeks. Um, it is a common chemotherapy drug. It was originally taken out of the yew tree you know, uh, isolated from the yew tree. It used to be traditionally used, you know, and historically it was used as a poison, but then it was found to have anti-cancer activity and developed as a drug uh, for chemotherapy. They can also enhance immune system. Uh, they can protect from cardiovascular diseases, reduce inflammation. Um, some of them have very strong anti-aging activity like vitamin C. Um, and can promote hormonal balance. So all those are obviously really good properties, right? But not every single compound is gonna have that. Different compounds will have different properties. So depending on what your wants and needs are, you would wanna pick, you want to know which ones, uh, which category of compounds you wanna use. So there are four main categories of phytonutrients, alkaloids, sulfur compounds, terpenoids, and phenolics and polyphenols. And each one of them, some of them are, you know, uh, have cross-reacting effects, and you'll see that. And that again goes back to the synergism uh, or the synergistic properties of natural products. But they each have their own little subcategory of effects that are important to them. So the first one is the terpenoids. Um, these are active ingredients in many essential oils. You'll also obviously find them in herbs and spices, which many essential oils are coming from. Um, they have some antioxidant properties, uh, so they can protect you from UV damage. They are usually rich in carotenoids and plant sterols. Uh, so carotenoids uh, can remind you that they would come in orange, red, and yellow colors. So Food sources that where you can find them would be tomatoes, peas, citrus fruits, carrots, and leafy greens. Within the terpenoids, these are some of the categories it shows you, and it shows you what each one of these categories can be used for. Um, so let's say that you are interested in looking at an anti-inflammatory terpenoid. You could look for a compound that has, um, you know, beta -caryophyllines. So you can focus your own uh, interest based on the activity you wanna look at. 
if you are looking for things against anxiety you know like the lavender using the use of lavender um, then you want to look for terpenoids uh, in your research and the specific terpenoid if you're looking for the lavender ones would be the lenalu uh, subgroup okay next we have alkaloids now alkaloids are actually toxic substances so for the plant they act as defense mechanism against insects and birds and other you know um, things that can harm them uh, for humans, they can be used as poisons or they can be used as drugs, depending upon the property they provide. Many of these, they can have analgesic properties, they can be stimulants, they can be anticonvulsants, or they can be paralytic. So just looking at that list, you can see lots of common, um, you know, lots of use for them in medicine, right? And that's what it is many of these have been used and are in use as prescription drugs nowadays in purified forms um, to treat pain to help with seizures to help you know uh, control seizures to act as stimulants to uh, help with surgery a lot of different things examples of these are codeine morphine so many of the drugs also that we can have in our uh, society uh, atropines, uh, which are also the heroin and cocaine, all those things. Uh, food sources of these, so when you think of simulants, obviously, is coffee, chili, and then contaminated rye. But there are many, many, many other food sources as well. These are the main ones that people see. Nicotine, you see, is also part of the alkaloid group, right? So you can see that right here as well. The next I see another um, typo. Anyway, so the next category is sulfur compounds. Um, so for sulfur compounds, these are glucosinolates and derivatives of sulfur amino acid uh, cysteine, and they reduce cholesterol levels and protect against heart disease. Uh, they can also protect against some types of cancer and boost the immune system. Uh, they are found in brassicas and onions, garlic, and many of the cruciferous vegetables like cabbage and turnips, um, and cauliflower, broccoli, all those good things. Uh, and I've shown you some sources, common sources of food on this site as well. Uh, so you can also see them in meats and cheese and um, things like that as well. The last category is phenolics and polyphenols. This is the one that you can probably find the most amount of research on uh, other than the alkaloids um, because there is just such a rich amount of um, phenols available in fruits and vegetables and there I have a host of activities that are very important in both normal health and medicine. So phenolics and polyphenols, uh, they improve bone growth um, they can also prevent bone loss. Um, they protect us from UV light, many of them, especially the antioxidant groups. They protect from UV light and they can help with the immune response. Some of them are astringents. Um, they are many times found in super bright colors, so reds, purples, blues. Those are super rich in polyphenols. Again, there are several types of polyphenols you can find. Um, I've shown you some common, uh, commonly known categories, and these are the ones that will have the most amount of research on them. Uh, overall, there are just two categories. There are flavonoids and non-flavonoids, and then you have all these subcategories within them. What you will see is that resveratrol uh, and quercetin, these two have the most amount of research, and then the others will also have significant amount as well. Sources of polyphenols um, include berries, legumes and beans, green tea, cherries, lentils, wine, chocolates, and some green leafy vegetables and nuts, of course. Um, they have very, many of them have very strong antioxidant properties. Uh, the antioxidants will protect body from free radicals, um, and they're essentially groups of vitamin, mineral, or enzymes and herbs. Um, they control the free radicals by acting as free radical scavengers. Um, so our bodies produce less antioxidants as they age to begin with. So if we are supplementing them with our diet and um, 
with supplements itself uh, with antioxidants that can help bridge this deficiency and also protect from disease as we age. The sources of dietary and supplement antioxidants would be fruits, vegetables, and herbs that are rich in vitamin C, E, carotenoids, seleniums, bilberry, ginkgo, green seed, and green tea. Um, some of these also have other properties, like ginkgo can be used for memory, right? Um, that's important in treatment of, or not treatment, but to slow the progression of Alzheimer's. Um, there are others like that as well. Seleniums can also have uh, a help with hindering the effects of uh, Alzheimer's as well. So that's another avenue that you guys could be looking at. Um, now, where do we find these free radicals, right? There are many sources of free radicals in our body. So some are internal and some are external. Internally, it's just as we breathe, we produce free radicals. That's just part of the game. Um, emotional stress and strenuous exercise increase the amount of free radicals as well. External sources, we have air pollution, we have cigarette smoke and pollution from cars and factory exhaust. The invisible uh, pollution, so-called from pesticides and herbicides. Uh, food contaminants. We have plenty of food contaminants that act as production uh, produ producers of free radicals. And then for cancer, uh, specifically chemotherapy and radiation would also be producing a lot of free radicals. Um, so the antioxidants, uh, when we ingest them, they will enhance our immune response. They will prevent initiation of uh, cancer by protecting the DNA. So they essentially bind to the DNA and protect it from getting broken up by those free uh, radicals that are hanging out. They can prevent oxidative damage to cells by actually binding to the free radicals and just kind of making them useless, rendering them useless. Um, and then they can also inhibit cell, uh, cancer cell growth and proliferation. So they can help both at the beginning, middle, and end of that little uh, pathway, not just at one point. So for your project, you are going to pick a disease or a disorder. It doesn't have to be, you know, you can have your cancer, some kind of respiratory viral infection, influenza, COVID-19, whatever, Alzheimer's, Crohn's, whatever it is that you're interested in. Um, you can, it doesn't have to be a disease. It could be an environmental stimulus. Uh, for example, you could look at sunlight exposure or pesticide uh, exposure or air pollution. So you can pick either one of those things. Um, then you want to choose a known or some supplement of interest that uh, you uh, know has either proposed or known how um, effect on the disease or disorder or stimulus of your choice. Uh, you wanna find a partner with similar interest and for that you would use that discussion board. And then you want to research your topic. For your research, you need to have at least five primary literature articles. There's no limit on how old they are. And you need to have one recent review article that is no more than five years old. Preferably no more than two years old, but at most five years old. Um, to talk that talk about your project or your interests. The review article will provide you with an overview of the topic um, and it may be it will provide ideas on what biological pathways might be disrupted or affected by your disorder and by the natural supplement that you're providing or that you're researching. And then in your primary literature, you have to now look for some molecular data. So this is what we are gonna be doing there. Now, you may find one article that has all of these components, but that doesn't mean you just find one article, right? You still need to find multiple articles. Another article may only have data on cell viability or just on protein, but combined with your multiple articles, you will be able to get a full picture. So you wanna find at least, like we said, three to five, you know, you'll have five total articles. Um, you want to find at least one article with images of cells with and without the treatment or with and without the condition or exposure. Um, then you want to find some type of cell viability data, either in response to the exposure of your environmental stimulus 
or in response to the natural supplement that you are researching. Similarly, you want to find data on protein or DNA analysis. For protein, it could be in the form of Weston, ELISA, or um, it could be some activity assay. For DNA, it will usually be in the uh, form of fax analysis or gel electrophoresis. Now, right now you may know about these a little bit and may not know too much about them. As we go through the semester and while you're researching this as well, we are actually going to be going through, that's why I wrote these particular techniques specifically, because these are ones that you will be learning about in the lab, actually, right? In either the simulation or in our lectures or other uh, activities that we run. So this is what you want to focus on. And then if you find some pathways, that would be great. But that is something that you, is an optional because we are actually going to take the proteins and DNA, genes, whatever information you find, and you will be making your own pathway anyway as one of your last assignments. So that's generally your uh, outline for the research or criteria for the research. For the last slide, I'm just showing you the project outline. So when everything is due, uh, you need to choose uh, your topic and submit a discussion. In uh, There's an assignment that basically says research topic and um, like your reasoning behind why you're choosing it. Um, and this is a group assignment, so you need to first tell me that you've got your group and who you're grouping with so I can link you together in canvas and then you will be writing a little just you know three to four sentences on what topic you're choosing and why and then the next week you will be turning in your annotated bibliography with a minimum of three of your you know uh, primary research uh, articles and one or two secondary sources for your hypothesis um, then the following week we will do quick meetups with each group to go over your research and answer any questions that you are running into or provide you with any help. Uh, then we will be doing a pathway in class that you will then submit uh, by 714 and we will work on the poster draft that following week and then you will have your poster presentation. So.